Welcome to the uh, Demography Today Lecture Series, uh, sponsored by the BBVA uh, Foundation, the Lompop uh, Horizon 2020 Project, and the Spanish National Research Council. And uh, we have a real pleasure to have today one of the leading demographers, in, certainly in Europe, but uh, as well in the world, that is uh, Miko Muscula, uh, who is the director of the Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research and Professor of Social Statistics at the University of Helsinki in Finland. He joined the, the Max Planck from the London School of Economics, where he has been Professor of Demography, and where he continues to work as a research professor and lead a research group funded by the European Research Council. Uh, Professor Muscula holds a PhD in Demography from the University of Pennsylvania in the US, and a PhD in Statistics from the University of Helsinki, and he worked, well, his work is quite uh, wide, but uh, he focuses on population health, analysis of contemporary fertility trends, demographic forecastings, and between other uh, topics. Um, and you will be seeing him in most of the best journals in the world uh, publishing. So it's a real pleasure that we managed to bring you here to our lecture series. And as usual, we have between 45 minutes to one hour talk, and then we open the floor for questions. So I believe I have roughly an hour time uh, and I try to use that time wisely um, and talk about some of the things that I've been studying in the last five, six, seven years. Uh, this is the summary of what I'm going to talk about during the next uh, 60 minutes. If I manage to communicate within this time frame these points, uh, I consider this to be a successful lecture. I have additional material too. Uh, we'll see if we get through all of that. Uh, but my point is here to communicate that, that although lots of things happen as fertility is moving to older and older ages, some of the things that are really important for understanding the implications of this fertility postponement, they are social. Not everything is related to biological aging of the reproductive tract of the women. So I'm, I'm going to make the point that the key mechanism linking uh, older maternal age, that is the age of the mother when the child was born, to child outcomes, they are offer, often other than aging related, physiological aging related. And these other mechanisms, they are social. These vary strongly from context to context to the point where the association between older maternal age and child outcomes can be strongly positive, strongly negative, and anything in between. So social processes are really important for understanding how postponement of parenthood influences child outcomes, and that is the key of my talk today. Um, this is a more of a traditional starting slide. Age of parents and health of children is the topic of my talk. Variation by context is what I want to illustrate, and I acknowledge uh, the founders of, of this study, uh, LSE, University of Helsinki, European Research Council and, and Max Planck Institute for Democratic Research. Uh, this is uh, a characteristic slide uh, introducing the theme uh, of postponement of parenthood in almost any uh, demographic uh, teaching course and any demographic uh, analysis. This shows how the fraction of fertility attributable to mothers aged 35 and plus that is often used as a threshold for, ad for advanced maternal age that has been declining since the 60s, 60s until mid-70s in these two selected countries. Patterns would be very similar elsewhere too. But since 1970s onwards, there's been a strong increase. And by now, about 20% of children born to women, 20% uh, of children uh, in Sweden are born to women aged 35 and plus. The US is showing a similar trend, just at the lower rate and almost all OECD countries would be somewhere showing very similar patterns. So fertility is moving to older and older ages, and some ask, how old is too old? What are the implications of this fertility postponement on child outcomes? Now this curve here might uh, potentially uh, look alarming, but if we put this down up into historical context, this is what we see, this last 50 years, this is the last 250 years. So let's go back. This down up. It's this thing here. Looks small. 
It's important, it's still important, but it's good to keep in mind that the fraction of fertility attributes of mothers aged 35 and plus, that has been much higher in historical times. The difference, of course, was that 200 years ago, fertility was high throughout the reproductive ages. So women were having much more children, starting from young age to uh, old age, and as a result, also fertility at older ages was high. And now the difference compared to that time is that this old age fertility happening at age 35 plus, that's related to total fertility rate of 1.5, 1.6, 1.7 1 of that range. Now, some are very concerned about the implications of this fertility postponement on child outcomes. Uh, Liu and colleagues, they wrote an influential review on parental age effects a couple of years ago. And they wrote that parental age has been shown to be a major factor, if not the most important factor, in producing variability in offspring. So that's a strong statement. And where, when it comes really interesting for a demographer is that they write that parental age at birth displays a negative association with offspring longevity. So you are born to an older mother or older father, you have a shorter life expectancy. Uh, and it goes beyond that. Similar associations have been shown for other health outcomes, autism, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, cognitive ability appears to be lower uh, for those that are born to older mothers. So there seems to be something going on there. And this is sort of a canon canonical pattern that often is observed. On a y-axis, we have a scaled mortality rate. This is uh, age standardized probability of death within 10 year age interval starting from age 50. And on x-axis, you have age of the mother when the child was born. So now we look at adult outcomes by maternal age. And you see that this curve comes down up to about maternal age 25. Let's see if this works. Yeah, comes down up to about maternal age 25 and then starts to increase. Now my interest in this talk is in this increase. I'm not trying to explain why those born to teenage mothers uh, have poor outcomes, high mortality at old ages, and also low educational outcomes compared to those born to mothers age 25, 30. I'm trying to understand what is this curve here. It appears that there's something adverse going on. Those born to older mothers have higher mortality, also at older ages. Now, why is this? There are lots of reasons why we might see, might, might see this kind of U-shaped pattern. Uh, reproductive aging is the one that is almost always put forward when these kind of patterns are being shown. On the mother's side, that might be just declining quality of the oocytes. On the father's side, it might be uh, accumulation of mutations in the sperm. But the basic idea is, the, is that the fundamental building blocks, the biological building blocks of the child are of lower quality if your parents are of older age. That comes from, from medical literature, but there are also social resources that might matter, in particular for the young ages. So those that are born to teenage mothers or teenage fathers might be born to families with low social resources, and these resources might be very, very important for uh, the development of the child. Now, the literature has this far paid fairly little focus on these three mechanisms that I try to illustrate in sort of a triangulization pattern uh, in my talk. Point one is orphanhood slash parental loss. Uh, let's imagine a time when life expectancy was 50 and you were born to a mother aged 40. Uh, that might imply that there's a high risk that you lose your mother to death before reaching adult ages yourself. And that this might be a social process through which parental age is linked to child outcomes. And I illustrate that this is actually potentially an important social process. Point two is period slash cohort effects. And by this, I mean a process in which decision regarding the timing of parenthood is also a decision regarding the date at which a child is born. I'm old enough that I could have had children without it being scandalous over three decades, in the 1990s, early 2000s, to 2010s. If I had a child in 1998, the outcomes of that child would be quite different just because of a different era in which that child grows compared to that, that child being born in, let's say, 2018 or 19. 21 years difference, that's 21 years difference for me, but that's also 21 years difference for the environment in which that child grows. And I illustrate that this process is very important. And then I will also talk about change in the associations over time characteristics of 
older parents have changed rapidly, uh, and this turns out to be important for understanding the outcomes of the children also. So, let, my, let me start with the parental loss perspective. Uh, this tells you details about the data, about the design, etc. Uh, but I will summarize this very briefly by saying that we use a large US scale, uh, large scale US uh, survey on older age health, the health and retirement study. That's perhaps the one, the, the most widely used survey on, on aging and health globally. One of the most widely used, certainly. Uh, we look at individuals aged 50 plus, and we look at their mortality rates. And we correlate that with what was their mother's age when these individuals were born. And we compare models that look at what age was the child orphaned or lost the mother to death. And this is what the patterns look like. This is what you saw already, a descriptive model that links old age mortality to mother's age. And it's a U-shaped pattern. And now we try to understand why is mortality increasing for those that were born to older mothers. We could control for social economic characteristics of the family in which the child was uh, growing up, for example, by, by including maternal education as a covariate or other factors of, uh, of the social economic environment. That really doesn't do much. This curve sort of persists to be strongly U-shaped. And although I'm sort of ignoring aspects of statistical significance here to a large extent, this increase <coughs> is significant statistically. And it's also important in terms of magnitude. Uh, so mortality rate goes from scale 0 0.15 to 0.18. That's in uh, hazard ratios. That, that already starts to matter quite a lot. Now, if we control for age at which the child lost the mother to death by using a very simple method, just a dummy for whether the mother was alive when the child turned 20, we see this kind of pattern. It's the black line. We explain none of the young maternal age disadvantage, but we explain almost all of the observation that being born to an older mother predicts high mortality. This is just flat all the way up to age 40. And then there's a small increase in terms of, of statistical significance. This is not strong in terms of magnitude of the effect. This is not also not strong. So it appears that there's an alternative explanation to the biomedical idea that being born to an older, to an older mother is bad because of some physiological processes related to the reparative aging uh, that then are transmitted to the health of the child. This, this is a social process, it's orphanhood. So, advanced maternal age is that, the culprit is that the reason why children born to older mothers fare poorly, or is that early parental loss? At least in this historical setting, somewhat historical, these are children born in 1920s, 30s, 40s, to some extent, 1950s, that's the US Health and Retirement Study uh, cohorts that are being sampled. We, we see that advanced maternal age effects, the advanced effects, they disappear when very crude controls for maternal education and orphanhood are introduced. So this calls into question what is actually the mechanism through which advanced maternal age influences child outcomes. Now, if it is, as I'm claiming here, that part of the mechanism really is timing of parental death, then that quite naturally leads us to question what would this association between child outcomes and maternal age look like in an environment where losing a mother at a young age was very rare. Uh, we also, in this study that I just summarized, we really did very uh, poorly in terms of controlling for all kinds of unobserved characteristics related to parental uh, social economic status. Uh, so now we move into an environment where losing a mother at a young age is rare, and we can control for unobserved heterogeneity, at least to the extent that it's shared between siblings. And this we can achieve using uh, Swedish register data, fairly recent register data. Uh, and this comes from an environment where mortality is so low that those that are born to older mothers, uh, they don't face a high risk of losing their parents to death. Uh, at the young age. And as you can see here, 
I'm saying that we predict that delaying parenthood is beneficial in this kind of environment. I'm going to illustrate that soon. Uh, again, <coughs> some details about the design. We use uh, Swedish military conscript records. This is only male cohorts. We will, uh, I, will soon, I, will, I will soon show you some results that, that also uh, apply to women, but we have no reason to believe that the patterns that I'm showing would be somehow male specific. We expect that this is the same for women. So we look at men born in 1950s, 60s, 70s, about 1.2 million men. These men uh, are linked to their mother in a way that allows us to identify sibling pairs. And we compare siblings that are born to the same mother at different time points and when the mother was of different age. And we look at height and cognitive ability. We have also looked at mortality at young ages. The results are very similar for that, uh, that outcome. So let's look at height, which in itself is not that interesting variable, but it illustrates the point that I'm trying to make. These curves here are height in centimeters on the y-axis, and this is maternal age on the x-axis. And each of these curves is 10 years of birth cohorts. They all show this kind of inverse U-shaped pattern. Those that are about the mother's age are around 30, <coughs> they, appear to be the they appear to be the tallest, and those that are born to older or younger mothers are slightly shorter. So that's the overall pattern, but then there's also cohort shift. Black line is the 50s cohort, blue line is the 60s, they are all independent of mother's age, they are all slightly taller, and red line is the 70s cohort, again, slightly taller. And let's do some sort of Lexis-inspired uh, democratic thinking here. Right? What are the outcomes of a child when a mother has a child at age 30 and age 40? Let's say in the 50s, a mother has a child at age 30. So this is the predicted height of that child. Height here can serve, for example, as a proxy for overall health of the child. If that same mother or woman, prospective uh, mother, has a child 10 years later at age 40, you don't go down this curve, you jump to the next curve, because that's 10 years later birth cohorts, and 10 years later, you are in the 40 age group, but giving birth at this birth for this birth cohort. So this is actually sort of flat or perhaps even slightly increasing pattern. And here is where the individual aging and cohort processes interact in order to produce a mechanism that allows us to understand why postponement might be good for the child outcomes. We can put all this into a regression framework that delivers the same insight. And this is what we do here. This is a descriptive curve, regression curve, that shows uh, on a standardized scale uh, how height of the child depends on age of the mother. And now we, have, we, have, we are pooling all the cohorts together. <coughs> now, if we do a sibling comparison using sibling fixed effects regression techniques, we can estimate what is the joint effect of postponing fertility to an older age and changing environmental conditions. And if we do that, we get this kind of curve. Uh, effect on child's height throughout this maternal age distribution is just monotonically positive, all the way up to age 45 plus. So this is Swedish registered data. It's, it's massive. We can estimate these coefficients uh, even for that uh, very old age groups. This curve is monotonically positive, so later is better in terms of child height. And, and these ugly big dots here, they, are, they denote significance at, P, uh, at point 0, 0.05 level. So this is not just a, sort of a fluke driven by low power. This is actually uh, accurately estimated trajectory that shows what is the overall joint impact of postponing parenthood and changing environmental conditions on child height. Now, it's difficult to separate to what extent this positive curve reflects uh, the positive impact of older parents being able to provide something better for their children, and to what extent this is just reflecting improving environmental conditions, for example, better nutrition overall in the context, 
or less exposure to infectious diseases overall. Uh, solving that is actually analogous to solving the age period cohort problem. And that, as is well known, really can't be done. We can estimate uh, the separate forces, but it, that comes with the strong assumption that we have uh, sensibly specified the APC model, uh, and that would be a bold claim. So please take this just as an indicative pattern. Now, if we take away the improving positive uh, social trend uh, from this maternal age effect, we get a flat line up to age 30. That means that mother's age net of improving social environment doesn't matter for the child's height. And then starting from age 35 onwards, there's a small decline. And this would be plausible if we think of uh, what the biomedical literature says about uh, reproductive aging. So this is certainly plausible. Whether it's true still requires you to believe that I was able to solve the APC problem. But this joint effect can be estimated and it shows that later is better for height. Now height in itself is uninteresting outcome. It serves as a proxy for overall health. Uh, things get perhaps more interesting in terms of the outcome if we do the same for IQ. So these data are built around the military conscription in which the men uh, complete a cognitive ability test that I will now uh, abbreviate to IQ. And now this shows the IQ curve by mother's age, mother's age, and this here is standard deviations. Uh, in terms of standard deviations, we see quite, in terms of magnitude, a strong pattern. Those born to mothers aged 40 have about, that, that's something like 0.3 standard deviations lower uh, IQ than those born to mothers aged 25 to 35. But this is again descriptive. If we compare siblings born to mothers at different time points and when the mother was of different age, we get the same pattern that we get for height. There's a monotonic increase uh, in IQ by mother's age. So this suggests that improving period conditions uh, can offset much of what might be the adver uh, adverse biological aging effect. Uh, and like with height, we can try to separate the effect of improving overall period conditions from this overall positive trend, and we get something like this. The curve is flat, like none of this, this is slightly negative, and it's understandable that if you are really born to, if you are born to a teenage mother, that might have negative effects on your cognitive development, but it's minimal effect. <clears throat> Same here, we see something wiggly, but one shouldn't really overinterpret that. It looks like net of overall positive period trends, these patterns are very flat. So, how <coughs> could one summarize this point two of the sort of triangulization exercise where I try to explain from, from three different perspectives how is maternal age related child outcomes? I would summarize this so that postponing parenthood means that the child is born to a later birth cohort and overall population level trends in the outcomes, if they are not driven by changes in maternal age distribution, they may then become important. And I showed this for height and IQ. Uh, we have shown this also for educational outcomes. Uh, there is the APC problem that tells you that you cannot really separate the maternal aging effect from overall period trends. You can estimate the joint effect, which in itself is important. Uh, but as for now, I have only shown you results from Sweden. And perhaps what I'm showing here is somehow specific to the Swedish environment. So let's take a broader look uh, and move to the demographic and health survey state sets. So I'm now going to do the same exercise that I did for Swedish military conscript uh, data and look at how maternal age relates to important child outcomes when I compare siblings that are born to the mother when the mother's mother was of, of younger versus older age. But the difference is that I'm pooling data across a very large number of countries, 77 uh, uh, countries covered by the demographic and health surveys. And what I do here is I divide this data into quintiles based on whether the progress in the outcome that I'm looking at 
is fast or slow, and I look at how maternal age relates to the outcomes or child outcomes in environments where progress is either fast or slow. So we are going to look at mortality at ages zero to five, child mortality. <coughs> uh, progress in child mortality over this time period uh, of last 30 years uh, varies dramatically across this time period. Uh, in Latin America, we see strong progress. In Sub-Saharan Africa, we see uh, weak progress. And I look at how the maternal age effect, so to say, varies across contexts uh, stratified by high progress, fast, fast progress versus low progress uh, in, in child mortality. And this is how the patterns look like. First, the overall aggregate pattern on this side. Uh, this is for girls, mortality hazard ratio by maternal age. For boys, the same. Boys have at all ages starting from age zero, or actually even start, basically starting from conception, even before birth, they have higher mortality than girls. And this is shown also here. Uh, and we see the weak U-shaped pattern. So mortality declines fast up to maternal age 25, and then it flattens, and then there are some indications of increase at older maternal ages. And this is pooling across all 77 DHS countries. And things get really interesting when we stratify by pace of progress in the outcome, uh, mortality at ages zero to five. This here is the regions where mortality was really fast progressing. And there, having children at a later age means that you are placing the child into a later birth cohort. Later birth cohorts in this environment have lower mortality, hence, all the way up to age 40 plus, later is better. So the environmental trends dominate whatever there might be uh, in the maternal aging effect. In the middle uh, quintile, we see strong decline up to certain age, or 25, and then flat. You don't get that strong boost from postponed anymore because the environment would be improving. Uh, and then in the regions where progress against child mortality were the slowest, you see what would be the predicted pattern uh, from the epidemiological medical literature that uh, puts the mechanism of reparative aging at the forefront when trying to understand how parental age influences child outcomes. So in this orange curve, you are in countries where progress against child mortality is very slow, and you see that mortality starts to increase for the children already at maternal ages 30 roughly, 25 perhaps already, already. So this shows how the environmental trends can fully offset, not just partially counter, counter avail, but fully offset and dominate the individual maternal aging effects. Um, let's then move to my <coughs> last point on this triangulization exercise where I try to show from different three different perspectives on how parental age effects vary across contexts. Uh, one would think that by now we know a lot about how in the process of fertility postponement, we would know how also the characteristics of the mothers have changed. Uh, we did, did, together with Alice Goises, we did, did quite a lot of literature review on this and came back slightly disappointed as very little has been documented about the characteristics of mothers, older mothers now and how they differ from older mothers uh, in dec decades in the past. So there's fairly limited evidence on how the profiles of older mothers have changed over time. Uh, I'll show you some of that uh, from our own research. Uh, but now that, I will, as I will show you, the profiles have changed in a, in a in a manner that is likely to be important for the well-being of the children, uh, it begs the question, how is this related to the outcomes of the children? And this is what I will also be showing you. Uh, we will be doing this, uh, we did this, and I will be showing you the results uh, based on uh, UK birth cohort studies. Uh, we pooled data 
from the key birth cohort study starting from 1946 birth cohort, then 1958, 1970, 1991, and 2000 birth cohorts. Uh, these are population-wide representative surveys uh, with the exception of the 1991 so-called Alsbach survey uh, that uh, was sampling only women living in the one single county of Avon. So you can, if you want, you can discount in your mind the data coming from 1991 uh, cohort. The rest is uh, nationally representative. Uh, and sampling designs differed slightly across these uh, birth cohort studies. Uh, it was somewhat challenging to come up with outcomes that would be comparable across these birth cohort studies. Lots of things would have been lovely to do, but because of comparability, we weren't able to do all of that. So we started with birth weight that is sort of the same, no matter whether it was measured in 1958 or 2000, and cognitive development that was measured around age 11. And there, there's a good reason to believe that, that the results are not driven by changing measurement. So, how have the profiles of older mothers changed over time? This graph uh, shows how the distribution of mothers ranked as high social class uh, based on the Registrar General's social class classification, how they have changed uh, over time if we compare the birth cohorts and very young versus very old mothers. So these red bars here, they are young mothers, aged 20 to 24. And across all these surveys, all these birth cohorts, uh, kids born to mothers aged 20 to 24 were of low likelihood to be born to families of high social class. Uh, these blue bars are mothers aged 40 plus, and these are higher at all age ranges, but in particular, starting from 1991, uh, there's a jump. So it appears that somewhere between 1970 and today, there's a big shift in the social economic characteristics of older mothers. They used to be somewhat better educated of somewhat higher social economic status compared to young mothers up to 1970s, but now the shift is just really dramatic. You could calculate the odds ratios from these percentages and these would be very high. So older mothers uh, used to be less advantaged compared to young mothers. Now they are clearly so, at least in terms of social economic status. And social economic status measured by education, occupation and so on will be important for child outcomes. This graph I, I find quite uh, Shocking, so to say. Uh, this shows you the fraction of mothers who in the survey said that they did smoke during pregnancy uh, in the and, and, and breaks the data by birth cohort and, uh, and, and age. And in the 50s, the mothers uh, said the young mothers and old mothers, again, young is uh, red, old is uh, blue, uh, in, in the 50s birth cohort, about third, quarter to third of the mothers said that they had smoked during pregnancy. In the 70s, this has increased to uh, 35 to 40 percent, but roughly, like there's not big difference, roughly the young and old mothers were smoking at the same rates. So even though by 1970, clearly the knowledge of the harmful effects, harmful effects of smoking during pregnancy on the child were well known, uh, this hasn't, this information had not yet been sort of transmitted into behavior. But then something happens in 1991, old mothers don't smoke anymore. In 2000, even less so, only 5% uh, of mothers aged 40 plus who gave birth uh, said that they smoked during pregnancy. But among young mothers, like these red bars, they just stay up. Among young mothers, we don't see this kind of behavioral shift so it appears that in recent birth cohorts, those that are born to young mothers, uh, they might be born to families of low social economic resources and also families in which behavioral patterns might be such that they are harmful for the children. Whereas if you are born to uh, an older mother in more recent birth cohorts, you might be born to a high 
social economic status family with high resources and behavioral patterns that are good for the development of the child. Now, how is this related to outcomes of the children? Let's first look at cognitive ability. Uh, and this shows you, again, cognitive ability standardized on the Y scale by maternal age, by birth cohort. These red, blue, and uh, red, blue, and green lines are, again, birth cohorts. And we see the curvature in these patterns, those that are born to very young and very old mothers, tend to do poorly, at least in the red and blue birth cohorts. And the red and blue, they are 50s and 70s birth cohorts. Uh, by 2000 birth cohort, that's the green one, there's a qualitative shift. There's, there's almost a monotonic increase. There's a bit of a dip at ages 40 plus, but at up to age 35, uh, 35 to 39, it appears that, again, older is better for the cognitive development of the child. These are measurements at, at roughly age 11. And this gap here that has emerged between those that are born to old mothers in 2000 versus those that are born to old mothers in 50s, 60s, or 70s, this gap is related to the changing characteristics of older mothers. Now they are socially advantaged. Their behavioral patterns are or behavioral profiles are, are beneficial. And, and this is what the descriptive data tells us. If we were to control for the advantage of the older mothers in the later cohorts in regression framework, we would get this pattern. So the gap here disappears, the gap that reflects how older mothers now differ compared to older mothers in the previous uh, cohorts. And this gap disappears and it really strongly suggests that the changing characteristics of older mothers have been really important in shaping how the parental age, child, uh, parental age, child outcome sensation has been changing. So how should I summarize this <coughs> third point of this triangulization? Uh, selection into older maternal ages has strongly changed. Uh, in the past, older mothers ten tended to be disadvantaged socioeconomically, and also children were of high, of high birth order, which I didn't show much yet. Uh, and nowadays, older mothers tend to be socioeconomically advantaged in terms of education, occupation, and so on, but also in terms of behaviors, they differ from, from young mothers in a way that appears to be important for the develop development of their children. So the social economic disadvantage has not, only, has not only disappeared, but it appears that it has turned into, ad, ad, into an advantage for the older mothers. I believe I skipped the results for the birth weight because they look very similar to what I showed for uh, cognitive development. So I'll move forward. Um, The story this far has been, to a large extent, that a later is quite often better, especially if uh, later means that you are able to place the child into a birth cohort that is born at a later date and that is benefiting from improving period trends. Uh, now, there are clearly undesirables also related to birth postponement. Uh, Aiming to have children at an older age is likely to increase the risk that one needs uh, modern technologies, medically assisted reproduction technologies, and it's unclear how these relate to child outcomes. It appears that despite the improving characteristics of older mothers in terms of social economic status, behaviors, and so on, it still appears that the likelihood of low birth weight increases with older maternal age. And it also appears that planning to have children at a later age might, risk, might increase the risk of involuntary childlessness. So let's look at each of these in turn. First, medically assisted reproduction. What is that? I believe uh, you don't need a uh, lecture on that. But Basically, that's used to overcome infertility when natural conception 
for some reason does not occur, cannot occur, or just does not. And, and medically assisted reproduction includes, for example, ovulation induction, assisted reproductive technologies, in vitro fertilization, and so on, and artificial insemination. Now, how marginal or broadly uh, used are these technologies? One can look at this from many perspectives. What, is, what are the usage rates and so on? Uh, one can also look at uh, what fraction of children are born with the help of medically assisted reproduction. Uh, so if one looks at rich world countries, roughly between one to six percent of children are born with the help of medically assisted reproduction. And these fractions are increasing at a fairly rapid rate. Uh, there's not excellent data that would actually show good uh, hard data on what are the trends, for example, Europe-wide, uh, but it's clear that with increasing uh, parental age, the need for these treatments is increasing. The treatments are also becoming more efficient. Uh, the prices are dropping uh, and health insurances are more and more covering these treatments without uh, strict age limits on who is eligible and who is not. So the trends are strongly positive. Uh, there's strong variation across countries in the usage rates. Uh, this uh, shows uh, assisted reproductive technology cycles per million women aged 50 to 45 per country. And, and these rates go from very high for Belgium, Denmark, Iceland to very low in Eastern European countries. So there's variation undoubtedly across these, uh, in the usage of these technologies, but this variation doesn't, cannot hide the fact that this is an important population level pattern that is emerging. Uh, if now 6% in some countries, perhaps even more, of children are born with medically assisted reproductive, reproductive technologies, probably in, in some years to come, uh, some countries will be getting closer to 10%, which is already very important population level uh, fraction then. Now, there are concerns about medically assisted reproduction. There are all kinds of concerns. Uh, there are concerns about uh, unequal access to these treatments. They can be uh, expensive, time consuming, painful, uh, and all kinds of characteristics of the couple or the woman uh, are very important in determining who has access to these technologies. But then there are also uh, concerns regarding child outcomes. It appears that, for example, birth weight uh, is lower for children that were conceived with the help of medically assisted reproduction. The risk of low birth weight increases. Risk of congenital uh, abnormalities also increases. Uh, risk of being preterm uh, born increases. So this is clearly documented. If one compares MAR babies to naturally conceived babies, there's a difference. There's a discussion on the mechanisms. Uh, so MAR babies are much more likely to be twins or even triplets. The risk is something of the order of 10 to 20 times higher uh, compared to naturally conceived. So that twinning, increased twinning rate might be part of the mechanism explaining why MAR babies have higher risk of being low birth weight, for example. But it also be, might also be that that MAR technologies themselves, these MAR procedures, uh, might somehow, in ways that are poorly understood, uh, poorly understood, might uh, result in poor development of the child. A somewhat contrarian perspective then is that perhaps it's not the technology and treatments themselves, but there's something in the couple, the man or the woman, that confound the association in a way that the reason that makes this uh, couple seek the treatments is also the reason why whatever child they will have is likely to have worse outcomes. So this might be an additional alternative perspective that would say that the treatments themselves are not risky. It's just that this variation, heterogeneity, uh, in the population in terms of who is more likely and who is less likely to have children of low birth weight or other uh, adverse outcomes. So we wanted to study this. The question is, 
as written here, have the effects of medically assisted reproduction on birth outcomes, have they been overestimated? If one accounts for the confounding, what would we see? And the key contribution here is that we compare siblings, one born naturally conceived and one born with the help of medically assisted reproduction. And now the question of course comes, well, are there enough of such sibling pairs or sibling sets in which you would have both? And it turns out it's not that rare. So we were using Finnish uh, register data, uh, total sample size 65,000. 4% of those were born with medically assisted, re assisted reproduction. That's 2,700 roughly. And in a within family analysis, <coughs> we were down to 1,245 children that came from almost 600 families. And this is not a trivially small number anymore. It is actually enough that we can do useful statistical comparisons of the children born within the same family, naturally conceived and with the help of medically assisted reproduction. I can tell you in the uh, Q&A uh, section then all about how we inferred a medically assisted reproduction from the data because it's not registered in itself. Uh, you need to use uh, information about medication use and so on, but I will skip those details for now. Let's get to the results. So these bars here show across various models how much smaller are medically assisted reproduction babies compared to naturally conceived. And in the purely descriptive model, this bar here shows that medically assisted reproduction babies are 250 grams lighter than, uh, than those uh, that were naturally conceived. This is in grams, we did the same for low birth weight, so this translates into a very large difference in the probability of being low birth weight. Uh, if we control for some basic demographic characteristics, in particular, uh, the fact that uh, medically assisted reproduction babies are often multiple birth, uh, we get rid of roughly half of that adverse effect, but it's still there and it's about 100 grams. And that again also translates into increased risk of being low birth weight. Uh, and we can further control for social democratic characteristics. That doesn't do much. But we don't yet compare this between family comparison still. We don't yet compare siblings that are born to the same mother naturally conceived and um, with the help of medically assisted reproduction. And if we do that, we get these blue bars. Even the baseline, we are down to 150 grams difference. And in the final model with full set of controls, including multiple birth, uh, we explain almost all of the disadvantage in birth weight for the children that are born with medically assisted reproduction. Uh, not all, there's some remaining. Uh, and the confidence intervals are somewhat wide, but this sum is now small. That's of the order of 30 grams, and that really doesn't translate into any meaningful impact on child outcomes. We can do the same for gestational age, and we could do this also for the risk of being uh, prematurely born, and we get the same pattern. These red bars here are, again, between family comparisons. They suggest, for example, here uh, <coughs> that those conceived with the help of medically assisted reproduction, they are born roughly a week earlier than those that were naturally conceived, and this translates into a meaningful difference in the risk of being prematurely born. Uh, if we move into within family comparisons, we are down to these blue lines that are still negative, no doubt. They signal a bit of a difference, a bit, perhaps a bit of an impact for the medically assisted reproduction, uh, although these are not statistically significant at the standard thresholds, but let's take the point estimate as, as the one based on which we uh, tell a story. Uh, this is something like one day, 1.5 days. This doesn't translate into a meaningful difference in likelihood of being prematurely born. So it appears that once you control for the obvious confounding factor that the couples that seek for medically assisted reproduction, there's something in their health that makes them need the technologies, and this might be related, related to child outcomes also, independently of the technology. Once you control away this fact, 
it looks like the effect of medically assisted reproduction on child outcomes is, is necessarily not that big. So, so even if there is a, is a medically assisted reproduction specific negative effect on birth outcomes, it looks small. If you put this in, in, in perspective and compare that, for example, with birth order effects, birth order effects being born first or second, these are bigger. Uh, this doesn't uh, negate the fact that medically assisted reproduction children, they are as a group still a high risk group, but it looks like <coughs> It's not because of the treatment in itself. It is because there is something in the parents that makes them a high risk group and their siblings naturally conceived would also be a high risk group. So even though birth postponement does risk, increase the risk of needing medically assisted reproduction, uh, it looks like conditional on, on having a child, the effect on the child outcomes is really not alarming for the medically assisted reproduction treatments. Now, how about low birth weight? That also appears to increase with uh, age of the parents. Uh, I will again base uh, results on, uh, on a study that, that we did in the UK context comparing uh, birth, various birth cohorts from the UK. And this shows how risk of poor cognitive development Sorry for the typo there, that's development. Uh, risk of poor cognitive development related to low birth weight is changing over time. Uh, these are birth cohorts 50s, 70s and 2000. You are by now familiar with these birth cohorts. Uh, and descriptive model the effect is going do down, uh, decreasing in magnitude, and with model one that controls for social democratic characteristics of the, of the uh, family, we see a similar declining pattern just at a different level. So what does this graph tell us? Uh, those that are born low birth weight, their cognitive development at age 11 uh, is lower, weaker, than children that they were not born low birth weight. That's what this negative Y scale here tells you. But across birth cohorts, the effect is declining fairly rapidly. That has more than halved in models that don't uh, control for any parental characteristics. It's roughly the same pattern if you control for parental characteristics. But the important thing is that by 2000, most likely thanks to the help of modern medical technologies, uh, that, uh, that are put in place for low birth weight babies, the adverse effect on cognitive development here, even though it's still statistically significant and negative, it's small. So now if we relate this back to parental age, parental, older parental age, especially maternal age above 35, that increases the risk of child being low birth weight. And that risk was very important for children that were born in 50s, 60s and 70s before much useful treatment for, for low birth weight babies, uh, by 2000, this effect has not really disappeared, but it has really declined strongly. So there are undesirables related to birth postponement, and one of them is low birth weight, but that effect has, <coughs> that the effect, low, like no one really cares about low, low birth weight in itself. We care about how low, low birth weight predicts later life important outcomes like cognitive development, and it appears that that effect is declining fairly strongly. Now, point three, involuntary childlessness. Uh, it turns out that we don't know much. Uh, there's no really good data that would show how birth postponement would predict uh, increased risk of involuntary childlessness. So that's the big unknown here. Uh, and even though much of my story here has been in some sense positive, uh, later, age fertility uh, might have positive impact of, on child development uh, and the negative impacts that there are might not be that alarming. It's possible that the unobserved here, aiming to have children at a later age resulting in involuntary childlessness, that that's an important one. And uh, on that 
uh, point I will need to disappoint you today because I don't have uh, good results yet on how these processes relate further to postponement and uh, increased risk of involuntary childlessness. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors. So everything that I presented was based on collaboration with fantastic people. Andy Fenelon, Perti Nelius, Kari Silventoinen, Finn Rasmussen, Rachel Margolis, Kieran Barclay, Alici Goisis, Daniel Schneider, uh, Berkai Ötskan, Hanna Remes, Pekka Martikainen and Raja Klemetti. Uh, I've really been blessed uh, as I've been able to work with these people. The ERC project on which much of the results that I presented uh, today, uh, that's done mainly with Kieran Barclay and Alice Goisis. So they were my fantastic postdocs in this project. Uh, and, and thanks to their uh, insights and efforts, we were able to produce some quite interesting findings uh, throughout this project. So I'll conclude with this. Come back to the first slide, that I, the points that I wanted to make. The key mechanisms linking maternal age to child outcomes, they are often other than reproductive aging. These mechanisms are social and they vary so strongly across contexts that these social processes, they are more important than reproductive aging in itself when we try to understand how maternal age is associated with child outcomes. So that's my sli last slide. I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have.